Right, I have one o'clock, so we will begin. And uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we have, it looks like 31 people on the line at the moment, and I'm sure all will come in. Um, and welcome to the webinar hosted by the Northeast IPM Center on how IPM can help to keep children safe from Lyme disease at schools and in suburban communities. And we too have two wonderful pre presenters today who have worked really hard on putting together a great presentation for you. I was privy to it yesterday and uh, look forward to hearing the whole thing. Um, so I'm just going to go through a couple of uh, housekeeping things. Uh, hold on. Ah, there we go. Um, there is going to be a recording of this presentation and it'll be up on our, our website. It takes about a week for us to put up uh, the website, um, the recording, the slides. Um, if there's any Q&A, we, we try to put that up for you too. And anyone who has registered for this webinar will receive an email from me. Uh, I'm Jana Hexter, by the way. I work for the Northeastern IPM Center. And uh, there'll be a link there that I'll send to you um, sometime next week. So uh, probably this time uh, of the week. And uh, we do welcome your questions. We really try to have these be as interactive as possible. And we ask you to use um, the question, the Q&A feature. So if you scroll your mouse over the Zoom thing, you should see a little um, box that comes up like a slide thing. And um, about a halfway through, there's something that says Q&A. And if you click on there, uh, you can type in a question and you can do so anonymously. And, um, and that way it's easier for us to keep track of the questions rather than if you put them in chat. Uh, if you put them in chat, then uh, they, can, they can kind of get lost. Whereas this gives us a capacity to see which questions have been answered. Uh, we can come back to them later and email you a response to those questions if uh, we uh, wanted to give you more information. So it's a much better way of handling questions. So um, please uh, use that. And uh, we also uh, want to introduce our presenters today. We have Andrew Lee. He's a research entomologist with USDA's Agricultural Research Service. And his research focuses on developing and validating new IPM tools for tick control and Lyme disease prevention. He's a principal investigator for the USDA funded Area Wide Tick IPM project, which is gonna be talking about uh, today and he receives funding from the Department of Defense's Deployed Warfighter Protection Program to develop novel tick control personal protection tools and products. And he's part of the Federal Vector-Borne Disease Integrated Pest Management Working Group. So welcome, Andrew. Thank you. And uh, Kathy Murray is an IPM specialist and entomologist providing statewide technical support for IPM adoption in agricultural and non-agricultural communities. She leads the Maine School IPM program, providing training to Maine K-12 school staff to support compliance with state IPM requirements. She also serves as co-coordinator of the Maine IPM Council and is a member of the Maine Vector-Borne Working Group and a founding member of the Northeast School IPM Working Group and serves on the National School IPM Steering Committee. And uh, so welcome uh, to you, Kathy. Thank you. Um, so we're going to be talking today about the scope of the tick and line problem and uh, IPM resources that are available for schools. And then Andrew is also going to be talking to us about preliminary research results that he has um, for his project. Um, but before we dive into uh, the content, we have a few questions for you. Uh, this is uh, coming to you from Cornell University. So there's lots of academia around us. So we have some questions just so we can gauge who is on the call and uh, what your level of um, interest is and uh, your level of awareness so that we can tailor the content. Um, so we now have this poll in progress and uh, we're gonna give you a couple of minutes uh, just to answer the questions. Um, and if you don't know the answer to a question, just guess, random guess, it's totally fine. There is no pressure here whatsoever. Uh, our semester is over, our exam period is over. This is, uh, this is just for us. So I'll be quiet for a couple of minutes to let you answer the questions and, uh, and then we'll see, see the results, we'll share those with you. Okay, so we've had a good number of people voting. I know I'm assuming there may be some people that are driving, so we'll take account for that. Um, so I'll end the poll and uh, we can share the results with you here. And uh, we won't go over the answers to the questions now. Um, but I will share um, 
this question at the bottom is how knowledgeable you feel about the topic. And um, we have uh, most people feeling somewhat knowledgeable, a couple of very knowledgeable people and uh, a couple who are not knowledgeable at all. So kind of a middle round. So that helps us in engaging, um, engaging the answers and uh, how we present to you today. So um, we will uh, move to the content now and uh, we're going to begin uh, with Andrew Lee and he is going to um, share some information with you about the sc uh, scope of the tick and line problem. Okay, um, first I want to thank uh, Gina for the opportunity to be part of this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, I know the topic is about the ticks and Lyme disease, uh, but before we get to that, I would like to spend a minute or so uh, just to talk about the tick in general. So there are about uh, 900 tick species in the world. In the US, we have about uh, 90 species. Among um, the 90 species we have, we have about a dozen or so are vector disease uh, that affecting human and animal health. As you can see from this table, the number of tick species we care the most, uh, including the deer tick, uh, transmitted Lyme disease. So actually, if you want to learn more, I can go to C CDC website. There are a lot of good information you can uh, get from uh, that website. So <clears throat> the next slide, please. The Lyme disease, as uh, uh, most of you know, the, uh, are transmitted by ticks, uh, deer tick or black leg ticks. Um, the pathogen is a burden, it's a bacterial pathogen. Um, so we only get the tick, uh, uh, the, the disease, the pathogen from a, a bite by a, a black leg tick. So the disease cause lots of suffering to people who have the disease. Uh, you can see the map here shows the distribution of Lyme disease are concentrated in the Northeast and the mid, uh, upper Middle West. Also the graph in the, um, on the bottom showing the number of cases uh, reported to CDC each year, it's about a 30 to 35,000 cases. A lot of time people uh, uh, think this over uh, is underreported. So CDC conducted a study uh, a couple of years ago uh, using our data, uh, such as the insurance data. So they generate a, a, a new estimate. Um, click, I guess the next slide. Yeah, so the new number is a uh, 300 son case per year. So it's a 10 times higher than um, we originally thought. Next slide. So uh, Lyme disease not only caused the great human suffering, but also caused uh, uh, economically um, to the people, to the society. So uh, there are studies, a couple of studies, about the, the, uh, the cost to treat the Lyme disease, uh, the cost uh, uh, from a loss, uh, loss of income, uh, loss of tax, uh, loss of product, pro productivity. So it's about $10,000 per case. Uh, if you multiply that by 300,000, so the annual cost or loss to the uh, uh, economy is about 3.2 billion. So it's a big issue. Next slide. So why uh, ticks are so hard to control? Uh, we know deer ticks are, are the only ticks that transmit Lyme disease. Uh, if you can control ticks, we solve our problem. Well, the real problem is uh, uh, the tick cell. Um, deer tick has a, a very complex li life history. Uh, it has uh, multiple life stages and uh, uh, many hosts uh, they feed on. Uh, take two years, about two years to finish the generation. So uh, very hard to control, uh, but the, uh, the feed on animals and have every opportunity they can get on people. So if you look at the graph on the, on the right, it shows the uh, uh, seasonality. Uh, yellow line here is the rainfall season. Now we are in May, it's just the beginning of the rainfall season. Well, the nymph really are the one uh, most responsible for transmission Lyme disease. You can see the graph in, on the bottom in the number of uh, uh, people contract Lyme uh, on a monthly uh, uh, basis. You can see these two really match well, very well. Next slide. So where are ticks uh, are in the environment? Uh, a study by Dr. Kirby uh, a couple of years ago, well, close to 20 years ago, 
basically the question, where do people get the uh, ticks? So uh, the study indicated the uh, uh, majority of the time, uh, the 75% of the time we pick up ticks from uh, uh, our home, you know, uh, the uh, backyard, front yard, uh, near our home. Uh, the picture show here is a nice maintained uh, uh, backyard probably, uh, where ticks are in the backyard. Probably not find them uh, often in the, in the middle yard, middle of the yard, but uh, when you're clear, closer to uh, the edge where grass, the wood area, that's more ticks uh, are found. But as, as I mentioned, the ticks feed on rodents, they feed on deer, so these animals carry ticks around. So the uh, they feed the tick as a host also carry and spread the ticks everywhere. Next slide. So this is a webinar about the uh, protect the kids, children uh, from uh, tick bite and Lyme disease. Actually, if you look at the, uh, the map uh, showing a school uh, in Maryland, which is surrounded by wooded area. So there's a very really good tick, I mean, tick habitat, a good uh, deer rodent habitat. So we had all the component to, you know, for, 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 for ticks. Uh, ticks, uh, children are really active, you know, at a school, uh, after school, at a park, you know, doing a school project, uh, hiking. So they are definitely in danger um, of getting tick by the Lyme disease. Next slide. Actually, this uh, graph uh, from uh, the CDC website is showing the, uh, uh, the age uh, distribution in the Lyme disease. So there, you can see there are two major peaks. When it's children, uh, five, 10 year old, uh, the R peak is, uh, you know, 50, 55 year old. Actually, uh, children uh, uh, have more children probably getting, uh, getting Lyme disease than uh, the older group. Uh, among the children, you can tell the, uh, the uh, boys uh, uh, had more boys like have Lyme disease. So definitely school children at a, a higher risk Com compared to other uh, age group in the population. So that's the highlight the need for uh, developing uh, a better understanding, better control uh, for IPM to protect children at the school. Great, thank you. It looks like we don't have any questions. This often happens at the beginning of the webinar, the questions kind of come in towards the end. If you do have a question, use the uh, Q&A bar uh, the Q&A feature in the bar, when if you scroll over uh, the presentation, you'll see if you click on there, you can put in your question and next time we take a question break, we can answer it. So we'll move on and Kathy is going to talk about um, tick management in schools. All right, well, welcome to the integrated pest management. It sounds like from the questions that uh, many of the participants on today's call are pretty familiar with what integrated pest management is. But just in case there's a few that uh, are not living and breathing IPM on a daily basis, like some of our uh, some of us are, it's it's a an uh, ecological approach uh, to managing pests and preventing them from being a, a problem uh, for people. It relies on our knowledge of, of pest biology and ecology. Oftentimes, I, I like to say that we, we use that knowledge to outsmart them, just to uh, protect ourselves and keep pests uh, below the level that uh, we, we consider a risk for ourselves. Um, integrated pest management when it comes to ticks and on school grounds, it, it's, it, the specific details vary uh, um, depending on each uh, situation. So they're customizable for each site, but there's four basic components of any integrated pest management which is a program, which is you know identifying and monitoring the pests, uh, developing an action plan that identifies who's responsible for what and what actions are going to be taken and what kinds of triggers uh, might serve to uh, trigger those actions. And then employing not just a single you know, action like a pesticide application, for instance, but employing a multi-pronged tick management strategy that takes advantage of, of all you know, biological, mechanical methods, in addition to chemical, if, if, if we even determine that chemical approaches really are needed. And the fourth component that I always urge all my IPM practitioners to uh, 
be sure to include is the record keeping and evaluation, especially in a complex system like a school where there's many different parts and many different people that are responsible. Keeping records and then regularly looking at those records will help inform uh, the decision making processes and serve as a communication tool for the next people that are going to take over for your job, for instance, you know, people move around and they retire and um, and so records are a good way of uh, communicating to the next group as to what actions have been taken, what was effective and, and what worked and what didn't. Next slide, please. Um, the first step in integrated pest management for ticks is landscape management, uh, keeping the grass mown. And by that, we mean all the grass and not just the, the stuff that's right around the school, but the tall grasses that kids go out into, especially along the margins of the school grounds, like in that uh, image that Andrew just showed, there's the trees are completely surrounding that school, but right at the edge, there's probably some uh, grasses that could be mown or weed whacked. Um, doing anything to prune um, shrubs and trees to decrease uh, shade and to decrease, yes, yeah, shade and humidity. That's where deer ticks like to, they need uh, humidity uh, to survive and live, and they find that in the leaf litter underneath uh, low-lying shrubs and, and underneath the shade of trees. So opening those areas up to sunlight will help to reduce uh, tick abundance. Widening trails, you know, there's a big push on having kids go outside and spend time in nature, and so we've built a lot of trails through those wooded areas, but keeping them wide so that a person can walk through without having to brush against vegetation is actually a, a good way to help reduce tick encounters. Moving the structures, the playground structures away from the wooded margins, and even installing a dry barrier of gravel or a, a pavement in this case, where this is a picture that I took of, of us, one of our schools in Maine, where they installed a bike path uh, at the interface between the woods and the playground. Ticks don't like to cross that dry barrier. It serves as a little bit of a barrier and helps remind people to stay out of the, the wooded areas uh, where the ticks are too. Next slide, please. Um, with ticks and Lyme disease, there's, it's a vector situation. There's a number of different hosts uh, that carry the Lyme disease and that, that, are, that the ticks bite before they bite us. And rodents are, are part of the key. The white-footed uh, mouse and the deer mouse are, carry Lyme disease and they host the ticks uh, that, that carry that and then bite the ticks, uh, bite those animals that then bite us and give us the disease too. So anything we can do to discourage rodent activity on playgrounds, uh, stone walls are still very much abundant in New England uh, around schools. So sealing those up with you know concrete and masonry to, to so that there's no not cracks and crevices for those mice to hide and nest in. Eliminating bird feeders is not a popular recommendation. I know a lot of schools like to have bird feeders, but if they can move them to a place where the spilled feed that comes out of them will not be attracting rodents or at least not attracting them to areas where uh, people are likely to encounter them, that might help reduce things too. And then finally, redirecting human activity, um, just keeping the people out of those wooded areas by uh, signage, uh, education, actually putting up barriers. There's some good resources uh, for uh, landscape management practices in addition to one that I showed at a previous slide. I think uh, Andrew might show it also too, which is that um, Tick Management Handbook by Kirby Stafford at Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. Um, has excellent recommendations. This other publication called Tick Safety in Schools put out by the Environmental Protection Agency. You can just Google for these or there's also a link at the end of my talk. And then I put together a little brochure specifically for Maine schools, but it, it encapsulates all those things that I've just mentioned about landscape um, management and keeping records. And it's on my website, maine.gov slash school IPM. Next slide, please. Personal protection is very much a part of integrated pest management, um, helping schools and, and participants to uh, apply repellent to exposed skin, wear protective clothing, do regular daily body checks, and education and communication to support those. This wonderful graphic here was created by my dependable summer assistant, Haley Mealy, who is a, a commercial artist, and I put her website there too, so you can find her other artwork. Next slide, please. And pesticides can sometimes be part of a comprehensive IPM strategy for um, schools. 
in uh, the way that pesticides are used for tick control is to direct a pressure spray right into the area where ticks are. A granular can also be used, but my understanding is that we think that the sprays are probably more effective and that they can, uh, you can use high enough pressure, direct it right into the leaf litter at the margins where um, people are likely to encounter ticks along trails or at the edges of school grounds. Timing is quite critical. Um, two or three applications timed for when the nymphs, the larvae and the adults are, are going to be active. <clears throat> In New England, <clears throat> that timing is about, <clears throat> sorry, um, mid-May when the nymphs come out, mid-June when the larvae are present, and then a third application in September to target the adults if it's really needed. But I urge people to select pesticides carefully. Uh, ask a lot of good questions uh, of your protect. You have to be licensed um, in most states. A pesticide application is highly regulated by state and federal regulations. You must be licensed uh, with a commercial applicator. Um, license to apply pesticides on school properties, and this is uh, no different. There are a number I have encountered, um, there are a number of new companies, they're kind of pop-up companies that are lawn care companies that have don't have quite as much experience with tick control as some of the more established companies, and they're offering things like, we'll apply organic pesticides every month and uh, on your lawn, and uh, you know, those are not the recommended practices, so be sure that you do your homework if you're going to um, consider pesticide applications, and a good resource to start is tickencounter.org, University of Rhode Island's uh, website has some good information about that, and Tom Mather is very knowledgeable. Next slide, please. So in Maine, uh, the tick pre pressure has been steadily increasing for, for quite a few years, but schools have been a little bit lagging. I mean, we have these pesticide regulations, and so they're hesitant to kind of take the step about um, having to hire someone and put out signs and notices to parents. So they've been lagging a little bit. But recently, well, in 2017, the school started asking me, Kathy, what, what should we be doing? And I said, well, I'll, I'll ask the schools what, what you're currently doing, and we'll try to develop some recommendations. So I did a little on, online survey. I had 46 of my school districts, which is about 175 of, of our schools that responded. And I directed these questions to the Integrated Pest Management Coordinator. Every school in Maine and some other states, too, is required to have a staff member that serves as the central clearinghouse decision maker for all pesticide applications and pest management activities on schools. And they said, yep, we're, we're doing some mowing. Um, we're discouraging and restricting entry into tick uh, infested areas. A few of them said, yep, they had tried some uh, pesticide applications. But a good third of those schools that um, know that they have ticks um, are doing nothing. Next slide, please. Um, so I said, well, are, are you monitoring for ticks? You know, monitoring is critical. You need to know where they are, um, if you're going to do a pesticide application, or, or even uh, direct people to stay away from those areas, uh, to know when the ticks are active, what, tick, what kinds of ticks they are. And so uh, I asked that question, and almost half said, no, we're, we're really not doing any monitoring. Of those that are doing monitoring, the greatest proportion said, we're doing it with passive surveillance. We're letting the school nurse pick the ticks off of kids and then let us know if it's happening and that's their surveillance method which isn't entirely bad but it's passive they could be doing more active uh, surveillance next slide please so i always uh use it uh in new england we're, we're proud of our sports teams of course you know and mm -hmm. we're talking to these ipm coordinators most of them are school facilities hands-on kind of guys so they appreciate this you know example of the the, the team captain and, and say I tell them you know you're the team captain but you've got these all these other team members and you really need to use them and include them in your decision making communication processes the teachers the coaches the office staff everybody plays an important role the nurse as we just mentioned she's uh, she or he are doing diagnosis removing ticks and they're an important key in communication and education too next slide please so when it came to those school nurses, um, we, we came up with this idea that school nurses really could play a really important uh, role in helping schools to advocate for and implement integrated pest management practices, as well as being a really cre critical element in education and you know, direct action uh, when ticks are encountered in schools. So um, as a member of the Northeastern School IPM Working Group, which is a group of professionals like myself and volunteers and uh, just any, it's open to anyone. Uh, you're all welcome to join. Uh, we meet bi-monthly by conference call. We put in a grant proposal and we were funded by the Northeastern IPM Center 
uh, to, to um, connect school nurses with uh, good, reliable tick information, uh, well, pest information. Next slide, please. This was a two-year project. Um, we, uh, well, why did, why did we pick school nurses? Well, like I mentioned, they're already their first responders. Uh, they're trained to use evidence-based practices. That's what nurses and medical professionals do. They take their leadership and education role quite uh, seriously. That's one of the major tenets of the National Pest Management, uh, National School Nurse Association uh, practices and, and policy statements. And they have strong networks. They're very well connected, both at the national level and at the state and regional levels too. Next slide, please. So we did a needs assessment. We did an online survey. We had 180, 827 participants from 10 states. Uh, we followed that up with a video conference where we did another uh, survey. We had 27 participants from five states participating in the conference. And I've uh, posted a summary of, of those uh, findings and the recorded conference on, on that web, my website, maine.gov slash school IPM. Next slide will show us what they found. So I, I asked them, uh, how concerned are you about a whole array of, of pests? And ticks was their number one concern, followed by mosquitoes and lice and a few other things. Next slide, please. And I asked them, what do you need? What, what do you want? And they said, we need concise pest specific information assembled into a packet with clearly written protocols, action decision guides, communication tools, and we want this on a website. So we said, we can do that. And they said, we, we could use some training too. And webinars is the best way for us to get training, but we'll all also participate in online self-paced modules. So next slide, please. So we did that. We developed some uh, guidance documents uh, for nurses, one for ticks, of course, and, and these other ones. Um, next slide, please. And on the back of each one of these uh, guidance sheets, it has uh, what they were asking for, the guidance flow chart, flow charts to tell them what, what are the recommended actions and options for them to do. And we were sure to include the parts about keeping records, reporting it to other people, monitoring as indicated by these, you know, the text in these circles here on the back of the tick management workshop, uh, tick management guidance protocol. Next please, slide, please. We developed some other communication and outreach tools, some little wallet cards, um, a little tick kit with a tick removal tool, a magnifying glass, our little wallet cards, a little vial to put a tick into. And I used uh, my gal Haley there to uh, develop some wonderful posters. And we've just put uh, the posters and all of these other materials, except for the tick kit itself, but the components that go inside the tick kit are all on uh, the Northeastern IPM website. Northeastern IPM Center's website. Uh, next memo, uh, next slide, please. Uh, we've been going on the road to tell school nurses about these. Uh, we go to the, I've been to the annual conference, uh, the NAS and National Association of School Nurses conferences. They, they have been very collaborative and very supportive of our projects. Um, anytime we have uh, announcements for webinars, new resources, uh, training opportunities, we send it to the school nurses. Association and they're happy to post it on their blogs, their social media, and their um, uh, newsletter, their weekly uh, newsletter. The state and local school nurse associations have also been really supportive and, and really appreciative. Uh, uh, I just went to the New England School Nurses Association conference this last weekend and, and gave out a lot of our materials and they were snapping them up. They like those. So next slide, please. Uh, we did work with NASN, the National Association of School Nurses, to update uh, tick-borne illness prevention assessment and care online training module for school nurses. It's available at this website here. Any school nurse can take, anyone actually can complete it. You don't have to be a member of the association to take the course. And it's available on this website. Uh, nurses can get one and a quarter continuing education credit for it. I work with Tom Mather. I should recognize him at the University of Rhode Island um, and I and, uh, and school nurses uh, help to update this, this uh, module for them. Next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to mention some other places and other resources where school nurses or anyone uh, can get uh, good information. Uh, the Northeastern IPM Center, there's their link. Um, Kevin Judd, their webmaster, uh, helped to set up a, a special website just for our working group. That's neipmc.org slash schools. And that's where we've parked those guidelines, posters, wallet cards, fact sheets for school nurses. In addition, there was an existing training module on not just for ticks, but specifically on pests in schools. 
and it's at a website called The Pest Defense for Healthy Schools. It's put, um, it's sponsored by the IPM Institute, a nonprofit organization out in Wisconsin. So those, uh, you can complete a certificate training module if you're a school nurse, uh, you're a custodian, uh, anybody works in schools, or if you just want to know what kinds of training, anyone can can take these modules, and you get a certificate uh, to prove that you've, you know completed the course. E-Extension also is another great place to get a lot of resources. There's a website called iSchoolPestManager.org, which also has access to those training modules that I just mentioned, and it, as well as additional resources. And finally, the US Environmental Protection Agency has a website called Managing-Pests-Schools, and that's where you can find recorded webinars and other good resources. And I think that's my last slide. Great, wonderful. Well, if uh, you have a question, now is a good time to uh, pop it into the Q&A. Um, it looks like we don't have any, unless someone's typing one right now. Um, I actually have, do have a question. If someone wanted you to come and present at a community organization or a conference, um, is that possible? Or do you have other people in your network who would be able to do that? Or um, if it's fairly close and largely local, I would be happy to do that, and I'm in Maine. Uh, but, but yes, we absolutely do have a good network. Um, people out at New York State, at Cornell, there's a number of tick specialists and members of our, well, pest specialists and members, even tick specialists, and members of our Northeastern IPM uh, working group. So I think that that would be, uh, if they wanted to contact me or the Northeastern IPM Center and contact that working group, I think we could probably help to find uh, someone that's uh, nearby that might be able to do that for them. Terrific. All right. Wonderful. And um, okay. Well, in the absence of any questions, uh, we have a quiet group today. Maybe everyone's eating their lunch. Uh, we'll move on to um, Andrew's presentation about um, the preliminary results from some really interesting research that he's been doing. And, um, and if any questions come up in the meantime, just pop them in there and we can answer them towards the end. Okay, I, I will spend the next uh, 10, 15 minutes to uh, uh, talk about the uh, an ongoing research project in uh, Howard County, Maryland. Uh, this is a USDA supported project, a five year project. Uh, the goal is to develop, develop and validate uh, uh, the um, IPM uh, strategy or recommendation or strategy um, we can recommend to uh, community homeowners um, to adopt uh, uh, to control ticks, including schools. Next slide. Well, you heard from Kathy, you know, about the, the, the handbook uh, uh, Kirby uh, put out a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, landscape management, uh, personal pro protection. But uh, when it comes to how do you actually control ticks, um, we don't have too many options in our toolbox. Um, well, Cassie mentioned about pesticide, uh, perisroid, and there's some uh, um, biopesticide available. Um, also, the other category, the host of target control, you might have heard of uh, tick tube, but bait box, these are designed to uh, kill ticks uh, feeding on rodents. Also, uh, there is one product developed by the USDA called a full poster, the deer feed and the treatment station. Uh, it's used to control uh, ticks uh, feeding on deer. So this uh, technology has been tested independently, but uh, not uh, much as a uh, combination, because as I mentioned, the deer tick has a complex life history. Uh, if you just target one stage at one time, uh, you are missing a lot. So uh, this idea for this project is to targeting multiple uh, life st stages at the same time using different control tools. Next slide. Again, this is a table uh, from uh, uh, Kirby's uh, handbook, uh, basically lists a, a number of chemicals uh, uh, we can use. Actually, depending on where you are, if you are property, a home or school near water, uh, creek, river, uh, you have to be careful because uh, pirate roads uh, are very toxic to fishes and aquatic life. So there are a lot of information uh, EPA put out, and, you know, how to use pesticides safely around home, schools, um, uh, 
So that's a good resource uh, uh, you can refer to. Next slide. Uh, in the last uh, 10, 20 years, you know, we are looking for alternative. We know Paris is working uh, against the ticks, but the, 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 the issue with uh, the toxicity to the environment, the non-target uh, uh, organism. So uh, uh, there are uh, people working on, uh, uh, to develop new uh, chemicals. One chemical standing out is uh, called uh, Nocturne. Uh, it's a, a, a plant, uh, uh, the compound from a, a, a plant. So I'll ask uh, yellow cedar. Uh, this is work by CDC actually. Uh, so it has been uh, tested against the uh, deer tick. Uh, it is very effective. But uh, uh, no products available uh, for use now because it's uh, still going through EPA registration. Uh, probably it will be a couple of years before uh, a product can be uh, put on market. Next slide, please. Uh, Biopesticide I will mention. I, actually, there, there are not a whole lot. Uh, Meta 52 is, is a fungus. Uh, it, a, had been, it was developed about uh, 10, 15 years uh, or maybe even longer to control uh, insect pests, uh, also test against uh, uh, deer ticks. Also, this work, a uh, curve work from 2010. Basically, they show this uh, uh, biopesticide uh, uh, was effective against the deer tick uh, when uh, tested uh, in the field plot. Um, the problem is that this product uh, was available last couple of years, but this year, I, when I tried to get it for our project, project uh, we couldn't get it because uh, uh, they had some issues uh, uh, producing the material. So basically, uh, we, again, we have a limited option in terms of choosing pesticide. Next slide. Yeah, I mentioned about four poster. Uh, uh, some of you may know. Uh, it was developed by uh, Dr. Matt Pond at the USDA in Texas. Uh, basically, it's a, a passive uh, deer treatment system. You use corn to feed the deer. When deer feed, come to feed uh, at the station, it against the, it's a neck uh, against the ruler, which is treated with pesticide. So it's a, it, it, the device has been tested extensively and registered with the EPA. Uh, now there's a company in Maryland uh, uh, marketing sell the uh, device. Next slide. Yeah, but back to uh, probably 20, 15, 20 years ago, there was another uh, project, a uh, major project uh, uh, in the Northeast, just uh, uh, to verify its efficacy against the ticks, uh, both the deer ticks and the non star ticks. Uh, the results uh, are, are very encouraging. It's a lead to 60 to 60 to 80 percent reduction after uh, uh, a year or two years of use. It, but it doesn't require uh, uh, maintenance. I mean, sustained use. If you quit uh, using it, uh, you know, after a year or two, uh, take me uh, uh, come back. Next slide. So uh, Bitbox, uh, I mentioned, uh, it uh, was developed by CDC uh, some years ago. Now it's a commercial products uh, marketed by Tickbox Technology Corporation. Uh, uh, when, 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 when mice enter the box uh, uh, to uh, reach the food source and uh, uh, um, it rub against the uh, uh, wick on the top. Uh, so uh, I think a fipronil is a pesticide and applied passively to rodents. Again, these products have been uh, studied in, uh, extensively, and showing uh, not only it can reduce the uh, uh, tick population density, it also can reduce the uh, infection rate in both the rodents and the ticks. Next slide. Again, as I mentioned, uh, as the uh, individual technology products, it, you know, there has been some study in the, in the past to verify its efficacy, but uh, no study has uh, uh, conducted by you know by using combined use this device uh, to see if we can achieve a better uh, efficacy, better control. So that's how this project was designed to test the combined use of two or three different uh, uh, tick control technology products uh, to see its impact. Um, uh, on ticket population density, on pathogen infection rate, everything uh, at a larger scale, at a community scale. So this project uh, uh, is supported by USA. We have many collaborations, University of Maryland, uh, Howard County, uh, uh, CDC, and uh, uh, Army Public Health. 
So uh, you can see there are seven locations that divide into uh, four different treatment group, which include one park serve as the entry to control. Next slide. Howard County, uh, here we have a lot of deer and rodents and uh, the home, uh, home are just right in the middle, middle of the jungle. There are a lot, lot of trees, a lot of animals, uh, so the perfect situation for ticks, uh, uh, for rodents, for deer, for everything. So that's the way, where we, uh, how we choose uh, this particular location. Next slide. Because the study involved, uh, you know, uh, doing pest control in people's the backyard, uh, it really require a lot of regu you know, uh, a lot of regulation involved. We had to get a permission from a homeowner. We had to uh, reach, use the uh, uh, flyers, uh, you know, knock on doors uh, to get up, uh, sign people up, get their permission. So there are a lot of preparation uh, going on before we start. Next slide. Yeah, this uh, uh, slide showing the general uh, layout of the uh, setup uh, 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 test site. You can see uh, 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 there are one row of house uh, in the middle there. You can see uh, uh, the treatment uh, behind the house in the wooded area. So we have a transect that we can sample uh, ticks, um, the yellow and green lines. So we have the square showing the bit box of, uh, placement. Uh, green, blue, uh, red dot here are the location for mouse trap. So we sample ticks, uh, we trap mice, uh, check uh, for tick on mice, and uh, collect the tissues, uh, uh, blood from mice, uh, and send to CDC for pathogen test. Next slide. Again, this uh, showing a picture of my team working uh, in the field, the really hard work, you know, working on mice, trapping on mice, you had to deploy the device later uh, in the day and they get up very early in the morning to, uh, uh, to check the tribes. Uh, really hard work going on. Next slide. So again, this, uh, uh, we started the project uh, in 2017, uh, first field season. Uh, basically, 2017 was a baseline data collection. Last year, uh, 2018 was the first year we brought the treatment. So uh, just some preliminary data I wanna show you. Uh, the table on the top showing the uh, uh, question tick uh, infection rate uh, um, of Borrelia in question ticks. Basically, you can see uh, there are a uh, big variation uh, uh, between state, uh, between parks. We have seven parks. Uh, so one park, we didn't see any uh, tick infect infected with uh, uh, Borrelia. But the, uh, our park, uh, uh, there are a couple of them have 20, 30% of the ticks are infected Borrelia. But if you look, look at the, uh, at the bottom chart showing uh, uh, mice, uh, not uh, again, not, not the mice, the uh, ticks remote from mice, you can see uh, about a 40, 50% of uh, nymphs are infected Borrelia and about 40% the larvae infected with Borrelia. So there are, uh, there are uh, 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 a lot of uh, host, I mean, the white photo mice are Carrying the early. Next slide. Uh, escape this one more. Next one. So uh, again, uh, this year uh, we uh, okay. Look at the bottom table showing uh, the uh, 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 pathogen infection status of mice itself. You can see the seven parks there. In 2017, the infection rate ranging from 33 to 70 percent. On average, about 48 percent of mice carry the pathogen. And in 2018, this remained unchanged because as, as we do not expect a major thing happen because last year was the first year we, we did any treatment. Uh, the top graph is showing uh, the, the tick sampling data, uh, the deer tick, uh, uh, mostly tick, uh, tick sampling. You can see uh, the red bar from uh, uh, 2018, the blue bar from uh, uh, 2017. Uh, overall, you didn't see, you know, maybe not a too big a difference, but uh, what I can see uh, uh, at the bottom of Meta 52, Meta 52 uh, spray in early June, uh, you can see there, there is a, apparent that there is, there is decrease of the uh, 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 tick uh, density. Uh, it's, it's a, 
it's just a one year data. I'm not sure uh, this will hold, but it's definitely encouraging. Next slide. Again, um, uh, we didn't have a whole picture. You know, we're still working uh, analyzing last year data, but the other indication also suggests that the, the treatment may work. Uh, these two graphs are showing um, the uh, the top one is showing the white photo mice uh, uh, percentage uh, the mice are carrying fever ticks. You can see um, different treatment on the far right. That's a control. Uh, the, the, the rest of three are uh, different treatment group. You can see 2018, actually we, had, we, we see uh, uh, the number percentage of mice carry uh, uh, takes actually higher than previous year, but all three treatment group was showing a decrease. Again, this is encouraging, but uh, we cannot uh, uh, have a, a definite answer. This is just a, a first year treatment. The bottom graph is showing a similar thing is in terms of number of ticks uh, on mice. So all these preliminary data suggest that uh, well, our treatment might uh, uh, start kicking in. Uh, we are just studying uh, studied the uh, second year treatment. Uh, this year is the year three the project, second year uh, of the treatment. So we'll continue to do this for the next three years. So uh, we'll see what the, the data will lead us. Next slide. Well, I don't have a dedicated uh, website for, for the project, but uh, uh, if you are interested, you can go to my USDA website. Sometime ARS put, uh, put out some uh, uh, press release. When we have a new funding, some encouraging things, a story you want to share with the public, we put out a press release. So that's one way you can uh, 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 learn more about uh, what's going on, what's new with this, this project. Uh, I guess that's all. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> so Nancy, do we have any questions that have come through? Uh, we did have a couple of questions that I answered online, but I will just go ahead and, uh, and read through them. Uh, Mark Lasher asks, once you find a tick on you, remove them, then what do you do? So uh, my answer is the first thing you need to do is identify what kind of tick it is. Is it a is it black legged tick? Is it, a, is it another kind of tick? Because Lyme is only carried by black legged ticks. So that's the first thing you want to do. And, and Tick Encounter, the Rhode Island, uh, University of Rhode Island website is a great, uh, has a really good tick ID section on it. And that would be my first stop. And then if it is a black legged tick, then you could, uh, you have a couple of options. You could send it in and see if it's test positive for Lyme. And if it does, then you could contact your doctor for, for prophylactic antibiotics some doctors do that some doctors don't so that's up to your doctor and you how you treat that um, if it is not Lyme positive and it, uh, also the uh, one question is how long was it on you if it's 12 hours or less uh, it's the treatment is less likely if it's 12 hours or more again up to your doctor um, how effective are antibiotics? Uh, depends on when you catch it. And again, these are, you know, we're not doctors. These are not medical questions that we're not really prepared to answer, but your doctor, your healthcare professionals, once you ID that tick and, and have it tested positive uh, are, are, is the place to go. So um, do Andrew or Kathy have either, any more response to my question, my answer? Uh, yes, there are a couple of uh, places you can send a ticket to for testing. Um, I know University uh, University of Massachusetts has a lab. They receive takes from a uh, public uh, with a fee, about fifty dollars. They do uh, a, a panel. Uh, I mean, probably ten, seven, ten different pathogens. They can test. They give. They will send a report to you, back to you. But also, I'm, I I want to uh, uh, mention. You know, other. If you find a, find a tick attached to you, even if it's a long throat tick, uh, I would also you know, let people pay attention, maybe, maybe send a ticket for testing because the uh, lung star ticket do not uh, carry Lyme pathogen, but it, uh, they carry other pathogen can cause a ser serious health issue to people too. Great. And I see another question came in is, uh, what diseases are carried by the lone star tick? Uh, they are uh, uh, anap uh, anaplasma. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the one slide I have showing a number of um, pathogen the lung uh carry. So uh, there's a sudden uh, 
a fever or something that was very serious. One of my colleague, uh, his wife uh, was bitten by a long short tick and uh, developed a high fever uh, uh, very rapidly. And uh, fortunately, he, he went to see a doctor and he got antibiotics, uh, got that uh, under control. Uh, I also mentioned that the uh, uh, red, uh, red meat uh, allergy. Uh, I'm not sure in the, uh, you know, uh, how many people know this uh, uh, illness uh, uh, um, triggered uh, or caused by um, uh, abide by uh, long short tick. It's not a pathogen, just a, I mean, just the immune response uh, allergy. Thank you. And, um... And there was another question, but it looks like that got answered. So, great. Well, uh, if I could chime yeah. in a little bit on that tick testing question a little bit, that's a question that I ask uh, the health professionals, epidemiologists uh, quite a bit, because there have been, it, it is expensive. Um, as Andrew points out, some of the labs charge as much as $50. It, you can get some good information from it, but I would hesitate uh, well, I guess I would caution uh, people that do take advantage of that, that the U.S. CDC doesn't actually recommend it, um, mm -hmm. and that they think that, uh, that the health professionals think that um, treatment should really be based on presentation of symptoms, um, though that precludes that idea by using a prophylactic dose of, you know, why, if you, if you have to wait till you get sick uh, to get treatment, that's not necessarily uh, very comforting either. But I, I guess I would just caution people that um, if, if the tick tests negative uh, for all of those diseases, you probably can take a, a sigh and go, yeah, whew, I'm off the hook. But if it tests positive, that's when it's, it's a, sometimes a little challenging to know what to do because uh, the ticks don't always transmit the disease. Um, uh, and, and some other, you, even if you, the t disease is transmitted to you, there's not clear evidence that everyone is going to get 100% sick uh, with that. So that, I just mentioned that the, uh, the federal health authorities, the US CDC, is actually not recommending that people have their ticks tested, though I know it's, it's popular and, and it's, it's uh, tempting to do it uh, because you want to know. Yeah, I agree. I heard the same story. I mean, uh, from a CDC based on if if the tick uh, is, was tested negative, uh, you still cannot uh, uh, rule out the possibility you're getting bite uh, from uh, other ticks which you oh. did not find. Oh. So you say even test negative, you cannot let your guard down. And say, yeah, I'm 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 totally safe. Because our tick got, got on you, you 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 were not aware oh, that we need to pathogen. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we'll um, move on now to have uh, some more uh, questions for you uh, based on the, uh, the not all the same as the first time, but uh, they are similar. And um, there's also an opportunity for you to sign up for more information for upcoming webinars um, that we're having and. Um, here we go. So here is the poll. And we would love it if you could fill it out. Same thing. If you don't know an answer, don't feel pressured. Just, just guess. Uh, it's totally fine. Uh, we just want to get a sense of how much people have learned during this webinar. And uh, so I'll give you a couple of minutes to complete that. So we'll end the poll as I think most people have voted. And um, you can see the results. Um, so it looks like the people who who were not knowledgeable or only slightly knowledgeable have moved. So that's good. <laughs> um, so uh, what is a good way to monitor and find to find where and what kind of ticks are active on school properties? And Kathy, do you want to uh, give the right answer for that one? Oh, you're on mute. Hold on, I will unmute you. Um, there you go. Okay, question number four was the question, or well, yes, right? Um, yep. What is a good way to monitor and find where and what kind of ticks are active on school properties? Yeah. Yes, I, I would advocate for active surveillance uh, in addition to passive surveillance. So just monitoring when passively, meaning uh, reporting when kids are, or anyone feels like they picked up a tick at school. But even more effective is uh, active monitoring using a square. A one foot by, I'm uh, sorry, a one meter by one meter square light colored piece of cloth attached to a stick uh, or a string and a corduroy or a flannel work really well for that purposes. And uh, dragging it over the vegetation in areas where you suspect uh, there to be ticks. 
um, or even if you are not sure uh, that ticks might be there. Um, and the ticks, uh, as Andrew mentioned, they have a, a behavior called questing, uh, where on mo when they're, they don't always quest, but if the conditions are right, they will uh, kind of stand up on their hind legs, put their front legs out and grab onto uh, something that is dragged over them, an animal, ourselves, our clothing, but this square cloth. And then you can uh, turn the cloth over, count how many ticks are there, identify which kinds and what stages of development the ticks are, and use it to identify where ticks are active, which kinds of ticks are there, um, and, um, and, and what time of the year they're active. Okay, great. And um, what role can school nurses play in tick management on school grounds and in their communities? And we had 100% voting for all of the above, so <laughs> is that correct? <laughs> okay. yeah, that's correct. That's all right. right. Um, can our school staff spray an organic tick control product on school properties? Well, that varies by your state and local regulations. Um, so, um, most states, as far as I'm aware, do not allow the school staff, unless they have a commercial pesticide applicator's license, to apply anything of any pesticide products. So an organic tick control product would definitely be a pesticide, uh, and you would need a commercial pesticide applicator's license to use that on school properties in most states. I would say probably 98% of the states. Certainly all the New England's, oh, I'm not positive about New Hampshire to tell you the truth, but most states. So stay, check with your state and local regulations. Some communities are not allowing, uh, they've developed uh, municipal ordinances and don't allow uh, any pesticides to be used. Um, All right, thank you. That's good to know because there was some, some debate on that one. And can our school purchase and use tick boxes and tick tubes on school properties? Do you want to answer that, that one, Andrew, or should I? Uh, Okay, I'll, maybe I'll answer it. Um, well, take a bo uh, bit box and take a tube. Uh, I'm not sure about take a tube, but a bit box require uh, professional uh, maintenance uh, distribution. So really, it's not up to uh, individual, uh, even a school employee, a homeowner. It's really hard to be handled by a uh, pest control company. Okay, all right, thank you. And several companies have offered to spray our sports fields monthly with a natural garlic-based product to prevent ticks. Would this be effective? I think uh, it, it, garlic can have a slight repellent effect, but it doesn't last very long. And it's certainly not going to kill very many ticks. And targeting the, the sports fields where the lawn is already mowed low anyway, um, it wouldn't be my, my choice. A re general recommendation if you're going to use a pesticide is to use a high enough pressure spray to direct it into the wooded area where the leaf litter is, maybe shaded perennial beds if, if there are ticks present there, um, and use a licensed applicator and, and select a product that is known to be effective. We'll have comments. There are lots of uh, natural products on the market. You know, the I'll have a label, big, big name, tick on, on, the, on the container. But uh, um, very few products uh, product have been tested, you know, scientifically say, prove it's working. So uh, first, there are a number of product, uh, products out there claim, you know, to be working. But uh, why search, you know, why the design my studies decided which uh, natural product to use. Really, I couldn't find a publication just demonstrate it's working. So uh, my point is you have to be careful. Uh, you may spend the money uh, doing all kinds of things, but it may not uh, get the result that you, you, you are wishing for because uh, the efficacy, some of the product have not been verified. Also, you know, a mass spray, we know you had to target uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the take a population which it caused a problem. So the timing is critical. If you, you had to know where the, the, starting in the population started increase, uh, just a regular mass spray, I think, I think it's not going to be, at least not be, going to be cost effective. All right, great. I think we answered the question about uh, whether you should have a tick tested. And um, 
So um, thank you very much for people to, uh, for answering those. Um, I just want to point out for any people who um, are IPM researchers or uh, in the IPM field, we have somewhere called Find a Colleague where you can add a profile of yourself. Uh, so that I don't know, Kathy and Andrew are probably on there. So if you wanted to find like-minded IPM specialists in the region, uh, you can put your profile there. Um, the archive of today's webinar will be up on our website um, uh, next week. And uh, if you go back to this link, you will find it. And also I will email everybody who's registered uh, for this webinar so that they have a copy of it. Um, we have another webinar next week on industrial hemp IPM. It looks to be another fascinating uh, topic and, and webinar. So I look forward to that. Please feel free to spread that in your, um, in your network. And um, this is uh, hosted by the Northeastern IPM Center. We're funded by USDA NIFA uh, to do the work that we do. And then also um, we have a whole long list of um, acknowledgements for Kathy's work with great, great thankfully, and uh, also for, uh, for Andrew's work. So uh, none of this would be coming to you without uh, significant funding, usually from the federal government. So when you're paying your taxes this year or had paid your taxes this year, some of it's gone to this. And um, so I just want to say thank you very much for everybody's uh, participation. And uh, if you have any other follow-up questions, feel free to contact um, Andrew or uh, Kathy or myself. And I uh, hope you found this webinar valuable. So thank you, Kathy. And thank you, Andrew, for your years of education and experience and all the work that you've done so that you can just pop on a webinar and answer these questions. <laughs> I do this so much. It's a pleasure. Thank All right. You. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you.